This is A New Angle, a show about cool people doing awesome things in and around Montana. I'm your host, Justin Angle. This show is supported by First Security Bank, Blackfoot Communications, and the University of Montana College of Business. Hey folks, welcome back and thanks for tuning in. Today's guest is Winona LaDuc, an internationally renowned activist, economist, and organizer working on sustainable development, renewable energy, and smarter, more secure food systems. I see crisis as opportunity and transition as essential. I mean, that's the fact is, is that if you want to survive, you got to make some transitions. Winona is a two-time United States vice presidential candidate, running both times with Ralph Nader. She recently visited the University of Montana for our presidential lecture series. It was great to get some time with her during her visit and dig into important issues facing not only tribal communities, but our broader society as well. Winona pulls no punches in this conversation, and she has the courage to question, if not outright discard, some of the basic assumptions guiding our politics and our economy. There is a lot to learn from here, and I'm excited to bring you our conversation right now. Winona, thanks for coming on the show heard in other interviews, you sort of haven't been enamored to the term activist, but a lot of people have used that term to describe your work. Just, I mean, just starting with the term activist, I, I mean, I just consider myself a responsible human being. Okay. You know, and I, and I kind of look at this big picture. And so like, I spent a lot of time trying to protect water and I feel, feel like wanting the right to water is a human right. Mm -hmm. And defending that right to water shouldn't make me an activist. That should make me a, a, a human being that wants water. And, and I, you know, I do rankle at the term a little bit. And, I, and, and I'm wondering why corporations who are going to contaminate your water aren't called terrorists. Yeah, good and, point. And, you know, that's a Montana question, certainly. Mm -hmm. There's certainly a, a huge amount of contamination from mining companies in, in, in Montana. And, 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 you know, to me, I, I want to be the person who can, yeah, I live in a place where you can still drink the water from a lake. You know, my job is try to keep it that way. I've, uh, you know, I've spent most of my life. I'm a, as you know, I'm a rural development economist. I um, also farm. Mm -hmm. um, you know, s uh, smaller scale. I'm a heritage uh, corn, bean, squash, tobacco, Jerusalem artichokes, and potato girl, um, along with basil because I happen to like uh, pesto sauce a lot. Yeah. You know, and so I've done that for most of my life, and I am now a hemp farmer too. Okay. Yeah, so I definitely I grow, want to talk about the hemp stuff. Right. I do. Yeah. I grow uh, industrial uh, fiber hemp. Okay. That's my that's my goal. So I, you know, I'm interested in um, how, you know, what our communities are going to be like 50 years from now, 30 years from now. Who's in charge of that? Mm -hmm. um, where your water is going to come from? Where your energy is going to come from? Where your food's going to come from? How we're going to treat each other and and who makes those decisions? It's not just a native issue. You know, it's really issues of, of how democracy is practiced or how we're going to survive, frankly, in the, in the face of climate change and, and um, you know, the, the catastrophic ecological challenges that we now face. So when was the seed first planted for this, this type of, um, this type engagement, of this type of leadership? I mean, I know you did your undergraduate at Harvard, studied economics, and then is that the point where you moved to the White Earth Reservation permanently? Yes, that's right. Um, well, you know, I come from a good family. My mother's name is Betty LaDuke, and she's an artist. And she has uh, always worked um, kind of in the, in the arena of art and social change. She, you know, she's 86 and does pretty much six by six or eight by 10 paintings. Wow. Yeah. She's pretty much rocking it still. She's been up in, in, in a number of places have had her art. But, you know, so I was raised in a, in a family that said, you know, you should, you should, you should speak up against injustice. You should be present. I was taken out of school for anti-war demonstrations. I, you know, was raised around farm workers. I was born in East LA, and 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 we mostly hung out with the native people and the farm workers there. So, you know, I have good family, good parenting, yeah, uh, good values. And so, um, I left Southern Oregon, small town of Southern Oregon, and, and moved to uh, Boston or Cambridge to go to school. I was politicized then, kind of in the larger arena. At that time, the indigenous people were first going to the United Nations, the UN Conference on the Rights of Indigenous People occurred in 1977 in Geneva. It was on the rights of indigenous people, the land of the Western Hemisphere. It was the first UN conference, United Nations Conference on the Rights of Indigenous People. And I um, had been a researcher 
you know, in high school, I debated energy policy. And my first case that I actually studied was the Amex Coal Company moving into Northern Cheyenne Reservation, okay. wanting to lease most of the reservation um, in violation of BIA uh, leasing standards. And uh, the Northern Cheyenne's tribe's battle against coal strip mining politicized me quite a bit. It, you know, so my, my initial, you know, studying of energy policy was really here in Montana. Sure. And then I, you know, kind of came to this point where I... You know, to me, these are questions, do, do large multinationals get to determine the future of your community? That's the question that I've asked pretty mm -hmm. much my whole life. And, and why do they get to determine it? And, you know, it's not only that the, that, that the table isn't set so that we're all at the same table. You know, we don't have any silverware. We don't even have a plate. Right. You know, if it's not even, it's not an even level playing field. Um, but more, it's, it's these questions of like, you know, who gets to determine the future of these communities and the, the long term economic and environmental impact of a lot of, of mega projects that have occurred. So I've spent most of my life fighting stupid ideas. Let's just be honest about it. Coal gasification plants, big mega dam projects, oil and gas leasing, nuclear waste dumps, um, and now pipelines. Um, but I'm far more interested in the solutions. Right. Um, you know, and so I've, you know, also spent a good deal of time on that. And, 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 and now I'm ready for the next economy. And so All ready for it. And so speaking of that, like your grounding as an economist, in your experience, how have... How has the discipline of ec economics both helped and hurt in terms of the issues that you've been engaged in? Well, basically, the you know, I mean, I went to Harvard, and and the economics paradigm that is taught and replicated in most universities, I, right. I assume here, is 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 dead wrong. It's dead wrong. Okay, it's predicated on an endless growth economy. We've run out of stuff to pillage. Let's just be honest. You know, everything that we're extracting now, the you know, energy return on investment (EROI) is pretty low. You know, right. that's what fracking is. Mm -hmm. Bottom of the barrel, might as well go down there, you know, send 602, shoot 602 chemicals down there, bust up the bedrock of Mother Earth and see if you can get some, some oil or gas out of there. You know, I mean, that's crazy stuff. It's, I call it Windigo economics, mm -hmm. uh, cannibal economics. And I feel like business schools should teach ecological economics. Mm -hmm. I feel like business schools should teach uh, equitable economics, not how you, you know, how a CEO's salary is 214 times that higher than an average worker. What's right about that? So, you know, I'm interested in, um, you know, economics is really, I mean, to me, it's about wealth for a community. It's not necessarily about the cash dollar, and it's certainly not about how much stuff you're exporting. You know, so there's the GNP indicators that we generally use in, um, you know, to denote the quality of our economic wealth in this country. But sure. on a worldwide scale, they're looking at things more like uh, gross national happiness, right. or happy planet indexing. Thoughtful, innovative countries are looking at, you know, what we really want. And having a bunch of money and stuff doesn't actually make you happy. Just look at America. I'm someone who's interested in the next economy. Or indigenous economics, because indigenous economics are land-based economics. And those, um, you know, I live in a place where we got wild rice from the same lake for 10,000 years. You let me know what American can t say that they've done anything sustainably for more than 10 years. Right. You, 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 you show me an example. Mm -hmm. Maybe we could learn something from indigenous people. That's kind of my thinking. And I'd like to see these economic schools kind of like get out of the, the box that they're in, you know, because it's a suffocating box. Of, and, you know, time to just kind of stick your head up and look around. I, I, I'm going to make an assumption that there's the, the potentially a tension in your work there's so much dedicated to stopping pipelines, for example. Yet, at the same time, you're talking about some real solutions, actionable solutions that can be implemented at a community level, at a, potentially can be scaled up to a national level. How do you kind of balance the, the saying no to bad ideas with saying you should be paying attention to good ideas and here's some good ideas? Good question. I mean, you know, there was a, a, great, uh, a great Dakota philosopher and prophet, I would say his name. His name was John Trudell. Okay. He passed away a couple of years ago, but he used to say, you know, people would ask me, how come I don't garden? And he said, because someone has to keep the beast out of the garden. That's me. Mm -hmm. And so I spent a lot of my time making sure that we can still harvest wild rice. You know, my community, um, you know, I worked with people in my community to stop the genetic engineering of wild rice. The state of Minnesota, the University of Minnesota wanted to genetically engineer wild rice and I was like, you know, it seems like wild should mean something. And explain, yeah, explain why that's a bad thing. First of all, I mean, you know, just, just to say that there's an example of a, a lake that the rice had been drowned out by uh, recreational interests of, of summer cottage owners. Okay. Is that, you, you got the picture? Yeah, of this, yeah right? I got it. So they kept the water levels high, drowned out the rice. So there's no, the rice. no cycle. 
Yeah, uh, I mean, uh, these two mi- water levels were too high for the rice. Got Drowned it. it out. Drowned it out for 17 years, another case for 50 years. And when the water levels lowered in a, lowered in a drought, the rice came back. So what's that teach you? You know, to me, that teaches you about the promise and the resilience of seeds. Mm-hmm. Teaches you something about how um, the creator and, and those plants will come back if they've got a shot, which is a pretty lucky thing for us, being the, the, you know, the Anthropocene, anthropocentric people we are. All about us. So I would go to these meetings with the university, and they were talking about academic freedom. And I'd say, well, what about academic responsibility? Hmm. How's that work? Yeah, talk more you know, about that. I mean, yeah. I mean, you know what I'm saying is like, you don't get to do human tests anymore on people just because you want to. Mm-hmm. You know, and so in the end, we ended up with a state of legis- a piece of legislation in the state of Minnesota. It took us seven years that um, requires a full environmental and cultural impact assessment before they can introduce any GMO rice. They've never, they've never, and they never will. They never will. Just super honest with you, there's a bunch of white guys who want to do a bunch of stuff. And it's kind of like, I've, I've raised a lot of sons. And it's kind of like, just because you want to, don't mean you get to. Yeah. You know, there's like a lot of ideas that you could talk to like that, that are like, hey, let me try this. Someone needs to be their mother and say no, you know, and that's what I kind of feel like. It's like, I'm like, no, you shouldn't do that. You know, someone needs to put some boundaries. So, you know, I've spent a lot of time, we, we, I've worked, you know, my, my whole life at it, but I work with a lot of people in, in defeating some bad projects. But, you know, at the same time, I'm interested in the next economy. And so, you know, I'm looking at things like the, the Green New Deal. Yeah. Is this opportunity uh, to, to look at that in a federal policy arena, but... I'm just going to go back to saying that in our teachings as Anishinaabe people, there's this prophecy. And that prophecy is called the time of the seventh fire. And in that time, we are told as, as Anishinaabe people that we all have a choice between two paths. One is well-worn, but it is scorched. And the other is not well-worn, and it's green. Mm-hmm. And we were told that we would have a choice upon which path to embark. I actually think that's America's situation. So let's talk about these pipelines briefly, because I, w- I want to spend a lot of time on the on the new economy that you right. envision, or the next economy. But at the same time, people should understand from your perspective, why are these pipelines bad? Why are they worth fighting? What are the negative impacts, both at the community level, but in, in aggregate, what do they represent? Right. I mean, and it's interesting to talk about that in such a fossil fuels dependent state as right. Montana. You know, I've been to Coal Strip, you know, what a monstrosity, a monstrosity mm-hmm. of coal generation. Let's just be honest, we're at the end of the fossil fuel era. You know, people can say whatever they want to, but time to move on. Mm -hmm. I'd really like a graceful transition. I'm not someone that feels like I want to crash and burn my way out. I'd like a little prior planning. Sure. We're at a stage where we can make choices. Make choices. No time like the present to make a couple, you know, 40, 50 important choices. Mm -hmm. You know, and so we're looking at infrastructure. We're a country that has a D in infrastructure. Yeah. Crumbling stuff everywhere. I'm, I'm not sure what's crumbling in Montana, but we had a bridge, you know, in, in Minnesota. But you know what I'm saying? Oh, yeah. It's happening. You know, and I feel like, and it's going to get worse with climate change. You got mm-hmm. torrential storms. Mm-hmm. You got big Harder winds. Harder stresses on everything. Everything is stressful. And, and we're not prepared. And I feel like, you know, I, I'm, I live in a first world country. And I, I don't want to feel like I'm not living in a first world country. I want infrastructure for people, not for oil companies, you know. And so... You're looking at a situation where, based on America's inefficient use of energy and a a huge amount of peddling by dealers, fossil fuel companies, we'll just call them that. Mm -hmm. So I I spend a lot of time fighting stupid ideas, but, um, you know, and the pipelines are really a question of where we're going to go, America. You want to keep shoving dirty oil down the, or you you want to move into something else. I mean, an electric car is 65% efficient. Mm -hmm. 65% 65% percent no, a gas car is like 15%? 16%. Of, yeah, yeah. So why would you want to be dumb people and ride around in 16% efficient vehicles when you could, you know, have an electric car that, you know, gets around? And so I think that there's a huge opportunity to not be stupid. I'd like to take it, you know? I like that. <laughs> <laughs> it's, like, it's like me. No time like the present to quit doing stupid stuff, you know? So that's one big piece of it is let's not do stupid stuff. Stop doing, stop stupid stuff from happening. Yeah. But I mean, we've talked about this before. You've got some strong ideas about good ideas. You know, the, the next economy. What does the next economy look like in your community? And then how do some of those ideas scale up? Um, yeah. I mean, the next the economy larger. is relocalized. Right. You know, we all live here, but the fact is, is that why would you ship food 1,400 miles from a farmer to a table? Yeah, that's interesting how, like, 
we talk all this talk about national security and food security very rarely enters yeah. the conversation. We can't feed ourselves. You know, that seems pretty fundamental. Yeah, food security, you know, and food sovereignty, food security is is is. I mean, it's it shouldn't be a political issue. It's a common sense issue. Mm-hmm. Y'all want to trust getting your food from California? Good luck. Besides that, they're using fracking water to irrigate those fields. Sure. You know, I mean, it's it's. It's you know American agriculture is is a ridiculous and dangerous situation and you know and and people talk about it as conventional agriculture no it's an aberration of ten thousand years of agriculture. People used to grow things and in fact most of the world still grows their own food and seventy percent of the world's food is produced by people like me, not by Kraft, Monsanto, and Syngenta. Mm-hmm. You know most of the world's food is actually produced in 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 our own communities by people a lot of them are women. You know, so I'm I'm a proponent of relocalizing food, you know, and then and then you figure out your trade agreements that are just and fair, and then some things you just gotta you know you you just you just not gonna do like I'm, I I have a hard time I really like avocados, you know I just don't think right. that's gonna happen in They're my they're not in growing my, in northern Minnesota right in my you know if I if I went on a strict carbon diet yeah. I wouldn't have avocados I like coconuts too I really like Thai food you know? uh-huh. so basically I see local energy. Um, in the time of power outages, I mean, I'm going to be lecturing about it later today, but, you know, just take a little look. Yeah. The grid's going down. Mm-hmm. Grid's going to keep going down. So why wouldn't you, Montana, want to relocalize your grid? So, you know, I would assume northern Minnesota, things like wind power would be a great wind option. Wind and solar? Yeah. You know, I'm, I'm, we are building a solar thermal panel manufacturing facility. It's called Eighth Fire Solar. Okay. Because like every that. time I say solar thermal panel manufacturing, that's like a lot of descriptions. But basically, south facing wall of your house, you put one of these eight by four panels on. It, the, Montana is like Minnesota. It's cold, but sunny, right? Mm-hmm. And so when it's sunny, that heat still gathers in that panel. And then that panel, when it hits like 90 degrees in the panel, turns on the, turns on the, uh, the thermostat, f- flips the heater fan. And then the fan blows the hot air into the house. Interesting, saves 20 to 30% of your winter heating bill. Now, why wouldn't you want to save it? Yeah. You know what I'm saying? So that's what I'm, I'm trying to address fuel poverty. I see crisis as opportunity and transition is essential. I mean, that's the fact is, is that if you want to survive, you got to make some transitions. And there's some pretty cool opportunities to do great stuff. So why wouldn't we want to do that? And so how are you helping people make these transitions in your community? How are you helping them install solar or decide that they're going to start growing hemp or, or other choices to relocalize their energy yeah, I mean, and food? You know, basically, and... I'm kind of like a community development economist in my village. Right. I mean, in my, in my tribe. I mean, I don't work for the tribe. I direct Honor the Earth, which is a national nonprofit. And I also, we just started Anishinaabe Agriculture Institute, and that's working on hemp. And, and that's, you know, the third example is, is hemp. As I said, I'm a fiber hemp farmer, and I'm going to uh, build a mill. Minnesota used to have 11 hemp mills. Wow. How interesting is that? Yeah. 11 hemp mills. We grew all our own clothes, and we made all our own rope. And we'll explain why it's a better crop than cotton, per se, to ah, be growing. Twice, twice the fiber per acre. Okay. Twice the fiber and per acre. And much less no water, No pesticides right? and no water. I mean, right. basically, I grow dry, I, I dry farm, dry land farm, mm-hmm. you know, which dry land farming in Minnesota is a little different than dry land farming probably in eastern Montana. Right. But it's a very forgiving crop. And, I'm not like I don't. To be super honest, the next economy should not look like the last economy. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you know what I'm saying is like there's some dumb ideas that continue, and we're just gonna have to shake that out of them. We'll be back to our conversation with economist and tribal leader Winona Laduke after this short break. A new angle is supported by First Security Bank, Blackfoot Communications, and UM's College of Business. Access to capital, broadband, and education are three ingredients any community needs for success. Hi, this is Sheila Stearns, Commissioner Emerita of the Montana University System and former president of the University of Montana. You are listening to one of my favorite podcasts, A New Angle. Welcome back to A New Angle. I'm speaking with economist and organizer Winona LaDuke about her vision for the next economy. You've been on two vice presidential tickets. Do you do you think about running again? No. No, not interested. I mean, I feel like, I mean, you know, people are asking me all the time, but I was like, sure. well, I mean, first of all, I have 17 horses. It's a lot of horses. Right. 
you know, I'm moving into the goat cheese thing. I want to do goat cheese. Like my retirement plan is to raise goat, you know, make goat cheese, you know, and raise hemp, fiber hemp. I'm, I'm working on it. You know, at 60, I'm working on yeah. the next the next plan, right? That's a pretty good plan. Yeah, I like it. You know, I'm like the relocalization and I'm doing that. And uh, it's, you know, as you likely know, I show up when yeah, they ask me. Absolutely. If they show, if they need me to testify in Washington, I show up. If they need me to testify in Minnesota, I show up. Because I want to, I want the system to work. I totally want the system to work. But I myself am a rural person. Okay. You know, I spent most of my life in rural areas. And I just really, you know. It's where you want to be. I, I don't really, yeah, I don't really got an interest in living in an urban area. I just don't. But, you know, my, my point is, is that, is that you need to, uh, it's a new economy for all of us, but it's predicated on land-based values, which everybody used to have those until they became a bunch of transients who worked for corporations. You know, there was a day when people's grandparents lived in the same place and they could taste the soil. People used to have a connection. And then in the past 20 and 30 years, we've gotten super distant. You know, the nature deficit disorder. I mean, most people spend most of their time looking at a screen that's about, you know, three by six. Yeah. And they don't even connect. You know, they don't even connect. You could go in a room, of, I mean, you and I know it. I could go in my household and, and you know, there'll be, you know, visiting bunch of people and half of them are 20 and they're not even talking to each other. They're all looking at their phones mm -hmm. in my house. I'm like, wow, that's so baffling to me. You know, our ancestors navigated by the stars and you can't walk out without a GPS. You know, you've mentioned situations where, you know, you're, you're mobilizing your community. And I, if, if I recall, you sort of said, and some white people were interested in that too. And so how do you view situations where the, the objectives of the tribal community align with the white community and when, when they don't in terms of mobilizing whatever coalition well, you're I mean, trying to mobilize. Nobody in Minnesota wants that pipeline. 68,000 people came out and testified and most of those were white people. Right, so that's relatively oh, unified. Oh yeah, and that was like a multiracial alliance that defeated the Sandpiper, which was Enbridge's first proposal for our state, okay. which is a fracked oil pipeline out of North Dakota. And so, you know, we built a multiracial alliance because we all drink the same water and we live on the lakes. And right. I have to say that my past five years of pipeline fighting, I'm a, I'm a water protector. That's what I refer to myself as a water protector. You know, I'm I'm interested in in multiracial alliances, and you know, to be honest with you, I mean, I actually think that once enlightened, once enlightened, let me just put it that way, then a lot of non-Indian people will will support you know what we're doing. How do we become? How's a guy like me or somebody listening, learning about these issues for the first time, or how do you become enlightened? First of all, you know, y'all got the opportunity. You know, you can look at our stuff at Honor the Earth or Winona's Hemp. You know, um, a lot of the issues around hemp, I mean, are emergent everywhere. I'm saying, please don't put glyphosate on your hemp. Please don't put pesticides and herbicides on it. Just let that be, those, those girls grow. You know, if you, if you want to, you know, I, I want agriculture that has life in it, not death. Yeah. And so, like, thinking about that, I mean, you said you, you can't grow... THC or, or, or marijuana on your on your property, yet there is this emerging cannabis industry. Yeah. Yet, and there's some effort, you know, that like you take the Colorado example, and they're they're taxing it heavily and raising money for presumably some some good things, maybe not all good things, but it's a revenue generator for the state. And you know, how do this is an example of somewhere where we could have we could have this next economy you're describing, yet at the same time multinationals, large corporations, pharmaceutical industry could move in and swoop no, it all up. I feel up. like, you know, put on your big boy panties or your big girl panties, okay. Montana. You know, do it right. I mean, I think that you need to support local, you know, what you want is a renaissance and a revitalization of, of organic farming or you want farmers here to benefit from it. And, you know, I understand that you had a, ma a legalized marijuana industry at the beginning of it and mm -hmm. then it got Years closed ago. down by the state. And so then who gets to grow? A bunch of multinationals? Like, I don't know. But Minnesota also has a, a, a medical marijuana, and they only have a couple of producers, and I think that they should open that up. I think tribal people should. And I'm going to be super honest with you. Like, as an economist, I'm so geeky. I was like, so I go ask all the dealers on White Earth. Not all of them, but, you know, everybody talks to me. I was like, so how much you sell? How much you sell a week? Uh -huh. And you start looking at that, and, you know, so say you've got a tribe that spends $4 million a year on b purchasing marijuana from the Oregon and Mexican and Colorado cartels mm -hmm. or whoever. Like, that's a hemorrhage to your community. Yeah. You understand what I'm saying? If you grew it locally, that money would stay local. 
Mm-hmm. And in fact, if you didn't have to buy it because you could grow it yourself, you could develop a relationship with those plants, which is what a lot of it is about, is relationship. If you think you can just purchase everything and you're going to be well, you're wrong. You know, and everybody here knows that. You can't just keep buying stuff to get well. At some point, you have to like go a little deeper. Scale it appropriately. Quit trying to be like mega capitalists. That's the, that's the fa- foundationally wrong. You know, this plant is an opportunity to, to rebuild a relationship with, you know, and, and the plant is so versatile from everything from the, from the hemp seeds, you know, my pesto sauce. That's what I do. I, I make hemp, hemp uh, heart pesto. Super hemp good. heart pesto with some of your basil there? Yeah, with like o- local hemp hearts, right? Ooh, and so then you have like nice. a local hemp. You know what I'm saying? It's like, yeah. what if you took that fabulous recipe and I don't have pine nuts? You know mm-hmm. what I'm saying? I used you to use to cashews. I was like, oh, those don't even grow near here. I was like, well, what could I use? Well, I could use hazelnuts. But then I was like, well, I'm growing hemp. Mm-hmm. It's got a super meaty flavor. I mean, not meaty. I'm just saying it's a rich oil. It's a rich nut okay. or a rich. So do cool stuff. Don't be like a jerk and try to make a bunch of money off of everything. Make a living, not a killing. Make a living, not a killing. I like that. Do cool stuff. <laughs> make a living, not a killing. I mean, that seems like the path to enlightenment right there. Connection yeah. with all these things yeah. we're talking about. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's like how you want to live, how you want to live. It's like super stressful being a capitalist jerk. (laughs) It's a hard life. I mean, you know what I'm saying? It's like, I look at those guys and I'm like, you look just damn miserable. Yeah. You know, I was like, why would you want to do that? You know, and of course, I've spent a lot of time fighting their stupid, miserable selves. But I was like, why don't you just be like, you know, a little more chill? Yeah. Smile once. once Smile once. Hang out with your plants. (laughs) Quit trying to exploit everything. You know, it's like way less stressful, you know. To me, that's kind of like, you know, the... You know, the Dalai Lama's approach. I mean, it's like, be, you know, be kind, be happy. Yeah. You know, the next, that's the next economy looks like that. I like that. Yeah. Of course, well, no, no, this, this seems like a great place to end it. Hugely thankful for the time we were able to spend together and you sharing your ideas and passion. Final question would be, if anybody listening wants to get more involved, I mean, you've mentioned your website, Honor the Earth, or your organization, and Honor the Earth. Hemp, if you want to help me capitalize the, the hemp, yeah. they call it the hempire. The Empire. You know, the Empire. The Empire. Yeah, so how do Strike people find your work? Yeah, at uh, Winona's Hemp is on, I think that we have both uh, Winona's Hemp.org on, and then we also have on my Facebook was Winona's Hemp. The other thing I'm going to be starting to broach the top- topic of, I just have to say, is this solutionary rail. Okay. Putting elect- Having electric trains and using the transmission lines along the rail to move your renewable energy from Montana. Hmm. I like that. You know, there's people thinking and there's people doing. And, you know, Montana, we, we don't want to be the last ones to learn about how to solve problems. We want to be the, you know, we want to, we want to, we want to do it, you know, so. Awesome. Cool. Well, no, thanks Thank for you. being here. Thanks Miigwech. for all your work and good luck. Mm-hmm. Thank you. Miigwech. All right. That was certainly fun, wasn't it? Thanks to Winona for sharing her wisdom and her passion. And check out her organization, Honor the Earth, at honorearth.org. Thanks for listening to A New Angle. We really appreciate it. And we're coming to you from Studio 49, a generous gift from University of Montana alums Michelle and Lauren Hansen. A New Angle is presented by First Security Bank, Blackfoot Communications, and the University of Montana College of Business. With additional support from Consolidated Electrical Distributors, Drum Coffee, and Montana Public Radio. AJ Williams is our producer, BTO, Jeff Amet, and John Wicks made our music. Editing by Nick Mott. And Jeff Meese is our master of all things sound. Thanks a lot, and see you next time.